today. June Palafox, who many of you know, certainly a high profile fellow in the architecture and urban planning uh, industries, 42 years of experience in the architecture uh, field and 40 years in planning, educated at UST and University of Philippines, advanced management development programs in real estate at Harvard University and attended seven other uh, special courses and then also lectured at Harvard, at MIT, and in 16 other countries in Asia, Europe, and North America. Currently country representative for the Council for Tell Buildings and Urban Habitat. Uh, this organization is headquartered in Chicago. They elected architect Pella Fox as one of two new fellows worldwide. Glad to hear that. He's a good representative for, for Philippines and what's going on here. Forbes Asia cited him as one of 48 heroes of philanthropy in Asia, one of only four in uh, in Philippines. And his firm, Pelafox Associates, planned more than 16 billion square meters of land and the design and architecture of more than 12 million square meters of building floor area in 38 countries. Um, the firm has received 200 awards and recognitions in the past 25 years. Uh, first Filipino architecture firm in the top 500 architecture firms in the world. Uh, the only Southeast Asia firms included in, in the list when it first uh, uh, came out. Um, the firm Palafox Associate ranks 89th on the list of the world's largest practices, which is amazing. I must uh, say, uh, June is in his group, uh, very impressive. Uh, and top eight in leisure uh, uh, projects. Uh, BCI Asia has awarded Palafox Associates a market leader in architecture in the Philippines for nine consecutive years. Um, so please welcome the uh, outgoing and um, intelligent uh, June Palafox to the stage. And let's sit down and enjoy a nice, uh, entertaining presentation. Thanks, June. Thank you, Richard, for the, um, for the kind introduction. And thank you for being here. And the title of my talk will be um, Architecture and urban planning: What business leaders should uh, should know, as Richard has uh, suggested. In 1977, 90 percent income of Dubai was oil. Today, it's I think only five percent oil, and the rest is uh, tourism, trade, and commerce, and sports, and so on. And then the third was create a garden city out of the desert. Create a garden city out of the desert, and the fourth was. Um, Make Dubai as a pace setter city in the world, in, in the Middle East, setting the pace. And number five was, which I like very much, was for every year of service for one month, go around the world and copy. I think he meant benchmarking. And my my colleagues, they went to the usual cities, London, Paris, New York. But I told myself, those cities it took them centuries to be where they are. So I look at cities which became first world country from the third world in less than 15 years. Number one is San Francisco. How did it get started? Uh, Go West Young Man, San Francisco. And it started with gold. And from gold, uh, became a construction boom camp. And then um, um, shopping center, you know, center, academic center, um, um, information Technology Center now, aerospace and so on. So they were able to evolve from gold to what they are today. And in less than 15 years, San Francisco became a first world city. Then the next city I went to observe was Hong Kong. Political refugees of, uh, uh, especially from, from China, especially Shanghai, they brought with them to Hong Kong their manufacturing skills and garment making skills. So Hong Kong became a garment center, manufacturing center, regional center, shopping center, tourism center. Then I went to Singapore, another instant city, if I may call them. Singapore practically copied Hong Kong with more landscaping. Then we went to Europe, two instant cities, if I may call them, uh, Zurich and Geneva. Zurich and Geneva, these are the refugees of the wars in Europe. The, the, 
The Germans went to Zurich, then the French went to Geneva region, the others are Italians. And they brought with them the political refugees, war refugees, their chocolate making and watch making. So that's how Zurich and Geneva started. Chocolates and watch, and they were able to evolve from one resource to the other. Instead of sticking to one resource, now both cities are uh, uh, global cities, headquarters of so many uh, global organizations, tourism, banking, commerce, trade, and so on. And you can see here Times Square and Broadway. He closed it down the traffic, became a pedestrian precinct. If you are there, you can hear languages from 200 countries. They have widened the sidewalk, reduced the moving traffic lanes, and more active open spaces, and encouraged you to... Now New York has a lower carbon footprint per capita than Montana. So New York, they have more open spaces than Metro Manila, but they have a very high density. Vancouver, one of the greenest cities in the world, it's uh, Canada's greenest city and North America's second greenest city, next to San Francisco. So the city's main goal is to be named the world's greenest city by 2020. Vancouver has also the best green building policy. And an amazing 90% of the city's power run through renewable resources, and most of it are hydroelectric power. Portland, Oregon, one of the greenest cities in North America as well. The first American city to implement an effective climate action scheme and was one of the first cities to ban uh, plastic bags. Next slide. So it's still in Portland. It has more LEED certified suburban towers when compared to other cities in the US. A lot of its workforce bike to work or use carpooling and public transit to, to go to work every day. And Brazil's undisputed green capital and the greenest city in Latin America. It has 14 urban forests over a thousand of public green spaces and 16 parks. So sustainable urban traffic management, Curitiba, Brazil. Still Reykjavik, the buses in the city are considered among the world's greenest public transportation systems because they run on zero emission hydrogen power. Barcelona, Spain. I think this is the last Ramblas. This used to be a drainage canal. That's why last Ramblas. And they, they cover it to make it a walkable street. In Barcelona, uh, Innovation District, in the last decade, the Innovation District called 22 at Barcelona. Uh, one thing with London, before they were not allowing tall buildings in the city. I had a long conversation with the city planner of London, and they tried, they allow tall buildings, provided there's a visual corridor, do not block the view of Big Ben, the Parliament Tower, and St. Paul's Dome. So by urban design and urban planning, you can go high rise. And at least one floor, most of them two floors, is for public space. Because when you put the tall buildings in the community, you practically take the redevelopment potential of the place. And you have a bonanza in land value, so you should also share with the community the benefits of putting up a tall building. So they have in London, aside from visual corridors, one or two floors are with public access, but you have to make an appointment for security reasons also. Stockholm in Sweden, Europe's green capital of 2010, voted as Europe's first green capital in 2010. Stockholm has 1,000 parks, seven nature reserves within the city, and residents annually recycle almost 100 uh, kilograms of waste Per person, 90% of the city's residents live within 300 meters of some green space. Uh, Hamburg, Germany, Europe's green capital 2011. For its efforts of redeveloping most of the city's urban core, Hamburg was the first city in Germany to be awarded the title of official city of the UN decade in 2007, second time award in 2009. 1905, Daniel Burnham planned, the American architect urban planner, planned Manila in 1905, Chicago in 1909. His inspiration for Pasig River was River Sand. And for the esteros of Manila, the canals of Venice. And uh, for uh, the Bay of Naples, for Manila Bay. 
So instead of getting inspired by an American city, he was inspired in his urban planning of Manila by European cities, Paris and Venice. And uh, you can see the river transport in River Zen. And Pasig River could have been this way if we followed the Burnham plan. Kingdom Tower, Jeddah, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. This is where I'm very active in the Council for Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, headquartered in Chicago. And as Richard said, I represent the Philippines and I just elected fellow last year, one of two in the world. Kingdom Tower will be the tallest building in the world, maybe in three years' time. It's more than one kilometer high. And it will surpass uh, Burj Khalifa in Dubai, which is 828 meters high. Taipei 101 Taiwan. This is one of the greenest buildings in the world. They retrofitted it in uh, Taipei. Next slide. And the Shanghai World Financial Center, uh, designed by Juan Peterson Park. Eugene Kong was, architect Eugene Kong was my professor in Harvard. This is now the tallest building in Shanghai. And I think that the, the third or fourth in the world tallest. Petronas Twin Towers. Uh, look, look at the, the image. That bridge, um, Cesar Pelli designed between the two buildings. It has a function for disaster preparedness. If one tower is on fire, you move to the other building. And it influences a lot of buildings afterwards. Pinakel at Duxton in Singapore. Again, this may have been inspired by the Petronas Tower. So disaster preparedness also. Um, vertical urbanism. Our Asian neighbors, they were inspired by European cities. Singapore, Hong Kong, Tokyo. More vertical. So they have more open spaces. And unfortunately, Daniel Burnham wanted us to have at least medium rise uh, cities. We're following the Burnham plan inspired by, by Paris and Venice. Well, the Americans were here, but when the Americans left, we copied erroneously Hollywood and Los Angeles, which were designed for the automobile. And the Philippines, only 2% of Filipinos own cars. And yet, our transport policy is for the automobile, not for the pedestrian, not for the public transit. So Tokyo, they have one of the highest car ownership in the world, if not the highest but they bring out their cars only after one o'clock in the morning when the trains are no longer running. So if you want to see the most beautiful cars, one o'clock in the morning, because uh, during the day they use the, they, they use the train. And weekend they, they bring out their cars as well. 75% of Hong Kong is open space, 75%. And if we use the residential density of Hong Kong, all the world's seven billion population, we can all fit in the state of Texas. If we just follow the example of Hong Kong as a vertical urbanism, compared to urban sprawl or in our Philippine cities and North American cities. Paris, again, they have a champion for good urban design, urban planning, and architecture, uh, Hausmann. And he was the implementer of Napoleon's vision for Paris. Wide boulevards, interconnected open spaces, visual corridors linking together the landmarks of, of Paris. In, in fact, if you have the, a parapet, they have a certain measurements that all of these parapet, I think three or four floors up, they should all be aligned. When we were designing Rockwell, we, a survey was done. We met through Manila, we walk only 400 meters, five minute walk. So if you happen to live there, everything is within 400 meters. Uh, shop, dine, learn and worship and work. There are also offices there, it's within 400 meters. It seems like we met through Manila at our threshold. And it's no wonder people getting off the MRT or LRT, there is space 1.2 kilometers apart. So people going down there, they still take another mode of transportation. We, Metro Manilans, we don't walk 1.2 kilometers. The Hong Kong people and the Singaporeans, they can walk two kilometers. Of course, because they have shaded sidewalks and safer sidewalks. Some of the buildings we're doing now, uh, elsewhere in the world or in the Philippines, we try to source all materials within 500 miles, equivalent. 
if you design your building or community, if you go green architecture or green urbanism, spend a little bit more on the design and put more green sustainable uh, systems and materials the first three to five years, design and construction. The next 95, 95 to 97 years, it will be savings. It will be savings. This is the urban housing of the future, which is already existing in most European cities. So the yellow is residential, place to live. The red or orange is working. The, the down below is retail and shopping. In 1977 to 1981, when we were planning Dubai, these were the concepts. Dubai, airport and seaport. Dubai is probably the first consciously planned aerotropolis in the world. Aerotropolis, airport driven city. And look at Dubai today. They have one million population and um, and they have 11 million tourists. For every population of Dubai, there are 11 tourists. We are 100 million Filipinos, we have 4 million tourists. And for every citizen of Dubai, there are 10 jobs available. So there are 10 foreigners working in Dubai, nine foreigners for every Dubai citizen. Because Dubai, they made it a free port and income tax free. Yolanda, my first, my first 17 hour, 27 hours in, in, in Tacloban, I met friends and clients from 42 countries, and they were telling me, June, even in accepting the generosity of your friends abroad, you are not globally competitive. They are complaining about the, the bureaucratic red tape in the ports, Customs, and somebody wants to repack the relief goods and change the packaging. So that really made me seriously think about my proposal or advocacy to make the Philippines free port, make it income tax free like Dubai, or Sing or Hong Kong, just fifteen percent tax for everybody. But Dubai, no no personal income tax, and everybody just pays consumption tax. Planning should not just be short-term and opportunistic. It should not be up to the end of 2016. That short-term and opportunistic. It should also be long-term and visionary. Maybe 2030 up to 2050. And may, maybe medium-term, short-term, immediate action, what can be done within the next 100 days? And then short-term, maybe up to 2016. Um, Medium term, maybe up to 2021. Why 2021? We will be 500 years as Philippines when Magellan first landed here. So it, it's a good target date, 2021. And hopefully, if we address corruption, criminality, and climate change, and infrastructure, uh, I think, uh, and pollution, and poverty, and the police, you know, if we can improve on that, we should be in the top 20 economies in the world by 2020. Again, we use this guideline for planning Dubai. Progressive, soft, and hard. The hard infrastructure, these are the roads and utilities. Roads and utilities. Uh, progressive infrastructure, these are the international airports, international seaports, international uh, uh, hospitals, world-class hospitals, international and international schools and so on. These are the progressive infrastructure. And the most important is soft infrastructure. These are the, the ease of doing business, no red tape, no corruption, being, and so on. And these were our guiding principles when we were planning Dubai in 1977. And the ruler of Dubai, Sheikh Rashid, instructed us. I was representing the urban planning or town planning department of uh, Dubai. And he instructed us, we, we sit in a round table, the different departments, from planning, engineering, transportation, traffic, police department, fire department. The instruction of the ruler of Dubai was, you approve the permit in one day. Because he says, the businessman applying, it's his own name, his own land, his own reputation. 
And the people working in government, they only think eight hours a day in the city. Where the businessman, he spends sleepless night making sure his project is feasible. And if there's any objection among you uh, approving fortnight, 14 days to justify your objection, it's not the applicant who will justify. It's the one objecting that will justify why he is objecting. If you cannot justify your objection, it's automatically approved. In our country, only the road engineers are deciding on the roads. They're now cutting down 3,000 trees along MacArthur Highway, planted about 70 years to 100 years ago. It's only the road engineers are planning them. And uh, I, I talked to the Secretary of Public Works and, and, and Environment. I told them, a 50-year-old tree, the replacement value is 9 million pesos. Because of the oxygen it gave the past 50 years, the fertilizer and water it held, and the beauty it gave the environment. In 2009, I got a libel case for, for exposing that we were required to cut down 366 70-year-old trees in Subic for a six-star hotel casino. We were appointed as the architects. And my conscience could not accept it. I returned a $1 million fee and exposed the anomaly. Corruption was involved. I got a 50, mi 50 million peso um, libel case for reporting it. So the 9 million pesos per tree, and those are 70 year old trees. So 12, 12 and a half million pesos per 70 year old tree times 366 trees, it's much more value than the $1 million architect's fee that we returned. And CNN, BBC, and Al Jazeera, they came to interview me. They told me, I'm probably the only architect in the world who would return $1 million in architect's fee to save a few trees. There's one more concept that I've been advocating, agropolis, the farm and the city, as opposed to metropolis. Because in uh, metropolitan growth, there's more parasitic relationship between the farm and the city. With agropolis, agro the farm, polis the city, it's more integrated. Uh, in a lot of cities uh, in Europe and North America, idle land in the city, they, they grow urban agriculture. And in the agricultural areas like the, the vineyards of France, they have the urban amenities in the rural areas. So people don't have to go back to the cities because even in the agricultural areas, they have the urban amenities. Uh, our plan for San Juan, we got cited by Berlin last year. So I was in Berlin last year giving a lecture and the case study was San Juan City of the Future in Metro Manila as, uh, because we, we, ha we had used the principles of SMART. And I hope future officials of San Juan will implement it. So allowing direct access to transit system, elevated walkways, like we work on uh, several buildings in the King Abdallah Financial District in Saudi Arabia where we have all the buildings will be interconnected from the ground floor um, from the pedestrians. In the ground, the pedestrian level, only pedestrians will be allowed and beautiful cars. If you don't have a nice car, you are in the basement level one or something. There are garbage truck, they are in the fourth level basement. And then elevated interconnected walkways, pedestrian skyways. So again, so you minimize the use of elevator. And also because of the harsh climate, encourages you to walk in the sky, skyways. Then elevated third level monorails that will be integrated with the buildings. The legal analysis is one of our problems in this country. And sometimes you buy a property, you are not told there, is, uh, there are encumbrances. And another one is, uh, I'm sorry to say, I think we have more lawyers per hectare in this country than any other country in the world. And you get paralyzed in the legal aspects sometimes. Next slide. Physical analysis. We look at the topography and the slope. Is it buildable, expensive to, to build on? Hydrology, geology, oceanography, vegetation, the wildlife, meteorology, other ecological and environmental factors. 
what we, we were taught in architectural and design schools is there are only four facades. The front facade, the back facade, the rear facade, the right side elevation, and the left side elevation. In my international practice and local practice, we have the fifth facade. That is looking from above. Uh, you can see it, let's say, in, uh, in Rockwell, a good example, or even Greenbelt, how it looks from above. If you are in a high-rise building, you don't look at air conditioning units on top of the building. You see the nice garden, nice swimming pool. So that's the fifth facade. Every project we do, we don't, we don't treat it like an island. We have connectivity, context, um, connectivity and context. Context, we look at the wider urban context and how the project will fit into the wider urban context. And um, maybe I might as well mention it because it's near here. When we were uh, planning, designing Rockwell, we planned it up to Edsa, where the Guadalupe Seminary is, and from across the river, and up to Ayala Avenue. We look at how Rockwell will fit within the urban context. So context and connectivity. This one, for instance, uh, schematic design phase. This was the master plan for Rockwell, although a lot of revisions now but the first five towers that we did the architecture also. So you can see the fifth facade. How it looks from the air, bird's eye view, helicopter view, or penthouse view. So looking down, that's my fifth facade. And how co contextual it is. Next slide. And again, this is in Clark, the Global Gateway in Park uh, in Clark, with uh, Kuwait Investments and, and for Peregrine. Again, how do you connect the 177 hectares? Yeah, we'll have a break after I, I do this. So 177 hectares, um, global logistic city. And uh, I think the Emir of Kuwait has committed $3 billion investment here. It will, it will create more than 200,000 jobs. So how connect the site with the Clark Airport? So it's a airport driven uh, development. So bubble diagrams or circles. I just gave a midterm exam to my students at Endor on last week. <laughs> it was part of the exam. Next slide. And schematic design, again, architectural space programming. So for every functional space, what's the floor area required? And so on. So you can do your uh, bill of quantities, specifications, and so on. What are our inspirations? For every line we draw, there's a storyline. So for the first concept, the inspiration is Lanihaya or the sand dunes. The second one is a Radwa Tower, something Arabic. The third one is the diamond. The fourth one is the Arabic Dao. Because the Arabs were mer merchants, the Arabian Dao. I think it reflects business, trade, and commerce. Uh, I think we'll continue this after the break. <laughs> So we, the next one is the detailed designing now. So from the idea, you can see now the Arabian Dao, that's our architectural design, reflecting like an Arabic boat, the merchant boat, or the, with green architecture. Yeah, I'll continue that later. Maybe we start from here. Thank you very much. Very good, June. A nice presentation. We have nice uh, hors d'oeuvres and snacks for everybody. Please uh, get up and stretch your legs. And maybe talk to June if, if you're interested in, in this break. Thanks very much. We'll see you in about 10 minutes. <laughs>